Did you know that two out of every three guys will experience some form of male pattern baldness by the time they're 35? Yes, I knew it. it for me, it was more like 25. I wish keeps been around when I was younger because advancements in science meant that there are now treatments that can combat the symptoms of hair loss and help you keep the hair that you have. Look, it's too late for me. My hair's not coming back. But you didn't have to be like me. You could stop your hair loss early. Thanks to Keeps. Keeps offers generic versions of the only two FDA approved drugs for treating hair loss, so you may have tried them before, but never for a price this low. That's right, if you were thinking, oh, Simon, this is medicine, it's gonna be mega expensive. Well, you couldn't be more wrong, it starts at just $10 a month. How does it work? Well, there's no need to visit a doctor's office, just schedule a quick online consult. A bit later, a discreet package is gonna arrive at your door, and you can use it in the privacy of your own home. So if you're noticing that you're losing your hair, that's not a problem that's gonna fix itself. I know that, do something about it for a limited time, go to keeps.com forward slash brain food or click the link in the description below to receive 50% off your first order. And now, today's video. When we picture the First World War, we tend to think of the mud and slaughter of the trenches in the fields of Belgium and France. But this is only a very narrow view of the conflict, for true to its name, the First World War was very much a world war, with combat taking place as far afield as the waters of the South Atlantic, the steppes of Russia, the deserts of Mesopotamia and Arabia, and the islands of the South Pacific. But perhaps the most far-flung and unusual theater of the war was Southeast Africa, where where German forces, though vastly outnumbered, fought a skillful and protracted guerrilla war in defense of the Kaiser's African colonies. It was this conflict which saw one of the strangest naval engagements in history, in which a pair of British motorboats named Mimi and Toto were hauled more than 200 kilometers overland to fight a German gunboat and win back control of a lake. This is the bizarre story of the battle for Lake Tanganyika. Germany, which had only become a unified nation in 1871, was a relative latecomer to the colonialism game. However, following the 1884 Berlin Conference, when the major European powers met up to divide Africa between them, she required a respectable overseas empire consisting of territory in what are now the nations of Cameroon, Guinea, Ghana, Togo, Namibia, Mozambique, and Tanzania. They also got Pacific islands of Papua New Guinea, Samoa, Micronesia, and Palau. And for more on what happened in Namibia, then German Southwest Africa, please do check our previous video. Video, Germany's Forgotten Genocide, the early atrocity that provided a blueprint for the Nazis. When the First World War broke out in August 1914, the Entente powers swiftly moved to capture Germany's colonial possessions. African colonies were mainly taken by British and South African forces, while the Pacific territories were taken by the Japanese, then members of the Entente. These possessions, slightly defended by small garrisons of colonial troops, all fell swiftly to the Entente forces, with one exception, Germany, East Africa, or Tanganyika, which encompassed parts of modern-day Tanzania, Rwanda, Mozambique, Kenya, and Burundi. Here, German General Paul von Letov Vorbeck, along with only 3,000 German and 11,000 native African troops, or Askaris, led a masterful campaign of guerrilla warfare against Entente forces, using the terrain to their advantage and conducting hit-and-run attacks against British railways and encampments. Knowing that the East Africa campaign was merely a sideshow to the larger war, von Letov Vorbeck vowed to tie up as many enemy troops as possible in Africa, keeping them away from the more strategically important Western Front. In this, he was successful, as the Entente powers were forced to send some 300,000 British, Indian, South African, Belgium, and Portuguese troops to East Africa in an attempt to hunt them down. Despite being chronically undermanned and short on supplies, for four years, von Letov Vorbeck managed to evade and defeat far superior forces and even invade a part of Rhodesia, becoming the only German commander to capture British territory during the war. These exploits earned him the nickname the Lion of Africa. With the land and sea routes into East Africa blocked by German ground and naval forces, Entente troops had only one remaining route of attack, crossing Lake Tanganyika. The second largest of the African Great Lakes, Lake Tanganyika stretches 676 kilometers north-south, and at the time, it bordered German Tanganyika to the east, the Belgian Congo to the north and west, and Rhodesia to the south. However, British and Belgian troops stationed in these colonies dared not cross the lake into German territory due to a small but powerful flotilla of German gunboats. At the outbreak of war, Germany had two gunboats on the lakes, the 
160-ton Hedvig von Weissmann and the 45-ton King Garni, both heavily armed with 37mm pom-pom automatic cannons. Within two months of war being declared, these ships had sunk all opposing British and Belgian vessels, giving Germany unchallenged dominance of the lake. In April of 1915, Hedvig von Weissmann and King Garni were joined by a third gunboat, the 1,600-ton Graf von Gotzen, which had been built in Germany before being disassembled, packed into 5,000 crates and shipped to the Tanganyikan port of Dar es Salaam. From here, the crates were shipped by rail to the lake port of Kigoma, where the ship was reassembled. In addition to bolstering German control of the lake, Graf von Gotzen would carry and deposit up to 900 troops anywhere along the shoreline to conduct raids on British or Belgian territory. The only ships the Entente could potentially field against the German flotilla were the German barge D. Tonne, the motorboat Netter, and the 1,500-ton steamer Baron Darnis, which lay disassembled in the Congolese port of Lukuga. However, the Belgians dared not reassemble her for fear that she would be discovered and destroyed by the Germans before she could be launched. The 12-pounder guns provided by the British to Baron Darnis were thus installed as shore batteries to defend Akana. Finding this situation unacceptable, on April 21, 1915, big game hunter John R. Lee arrived at the British Admiralty in London to meet first sea lord Sir Henry Jackson. Lee, who had observed the German flotilla on Lake Tanganyika, had noted that the gunboats were relatively slow and that their heaviest armament was only capable of firing forward. He thus suggested that the Royal Navy deploy a force of small, fast motor launchers armed with three-pounder guns, which would be able to outrun, outmaneuver, and outgun the German gunboats. There was also a further advantage to using small launches. As there was no direct river or rail link to Lake Tanganyika from the coast, any vessel deployed on the lake would have to be dragged overland for a considerable distance. A vessel small enough to be transported in one piece could be launched immediately upon arrival, reducing the risk of it being discovered and destroyed while being assembled. Despite the outlandish nature of the plan, Admiral Jackson approved of it, stating, It is both the duty and the tradition of the Royal Navy to engage the enemy wherever there is water to float a ship. To head this quintessentially eccentric British mission, Admiral Jackson chose quintessentially British eccentric Captain Geoffrey Basil Spicer Simpson. A irrepressible braggart, hothead, and independent spirit, Simpson never missed an opportunity to show off the elaborate tattoos he had acquired while serving in the Far East, and whenever possible wore a khaki kilt in place of regular uniform trousers. Vessels under his command also had the nasty habit of coming to grief. While testing the defenses of Portsmouth Harbour in 1905, he had managed to run his patrol boat aground and later collided with another vessel, resulting in the death of a sailor. On November the 11th, 1914, while commanding the torpedo gunboat the HMS Niger, he had stepped ashore to visit his wife at a nearby hotel, only to watch as his ship was torpedoed and sunk by a German U-boat. Due to these various misadventures, Spicer Simpson was relegated to the Admiralty to a just job transferring merchant marine sailors into the Navy. However, despite his shortcomings, Spicer Simpson had experience in Africa and was fluent in German and French, making him the ideal man for the Lake Tanganyika mission. Furthermore, the Admiralty saw little risk in sending a man they saw as a liability to a remote backwater in East Africa. For the mission, Spicer Simpson chose a pair of 40-foot mahogany motorboats, which were fitted with Maxim machine guns and three-pounder quick-firing cannons. Spicer Simpson initially suggested naming the vessels Cat and Dog, but this was rejected by the Admiralty. They did, however, approve the names Mimi and Toto, French for Meow Meow and Bow Wow. Mimi and Toto were tested in the Thames on June 8, 1915, and while both performed to expectations, one of the three-pounder guns was found to be improperly bolted to the deck, sending both it and its gunner flying into the river when test fired. The tests complete, on June the 15th, the motorboats were loaded aboard the steamer SS Leanne Stephan Castle and set off on their epic 16,000 kilometer journey to Lake Tanganyika. After 17 days, the Land Stephan Castle arrived at the South African port of Cape Town, where Mimi and Toto were loaded onto railway flat cars and transported north by train to Elizabethville in the Belgian Congo. From here, the boats were loaded onto special cradles and were dragged by oxen and steam tractors through the dense bush and deep gorges of the Mitumba mountains to the railhead at San Kissia. This was a grueling journey of 235 kilometers. From San Kissia, the boats were taken 30 kilometers by rail to Bukama, then sailed down the Lualaba River and across Lake Kasale to Kabolo. The water in Lualaba was low, causing the boats to run aground 14 times over 20 kilometers of each. Spicer Simpson's quip was a record, I think, for His Majesty's ships. The flotilla reached Kabalo on October the 22nd, and following a 280-kilometer rail journey, finally arrived in Kalami, 
just south of Lukuga. Against all odds, the little boats had made it intact across nearly 3,000 kilometers of some of the world's most challenging terrain. But Spicer Simpson's arrival had not gone unnoticed by the Germans. On the morning of December 1, 1915, the gunboat King Garni, under the command of Lieutenant Job Rosenthal, approached Kalimi to investigate enemy activity, only to be driven away by shore batteries. King Garni returned later that evening, allowing Rosenthal to swim ashore and get a closer look at the harbor. There he discovered Mimi and Toto and the slipways Spicer Simpson had constructed to launch them. Rosenthal tried to return to King Garni, but was unable to find her in the dark, and with dawn approaching, the gunboat departed without him. While waiting for King Garni to return, Rosenthal was spotted and captured by Belgian soldiers, and he was unable to report his discovery of the British motorboats. The slipways at Kalimi were completed on December the 22nd, and Mimi and Toto launched two days later. This timing proved fortuitous, for on the morning of December the 26th, the Kingani, now under the command of Sub-Lieutenant Jung, suddenly appeared outside Kalimi. Breaking off his morning prayer, Spicer Simpson ordered his men to their vessels, and before he could say, Shy Sir, Lieutenant Jung found himself set upon by a pair of fast motorboats bearing the Royal Navy's white ensign. In a brief but furious battle, the motorboats ran rings around the Kingani and scored a direct hit on a forward gun, killing Lieutenant Jung and two petty officers. After barely 11 minutes, the Kingani's chief engineer struck the ship's colors and surrendered her to the British. Simpson Circus, as it had become known, had scored its first victory. Three German and eight African crewmen were taken prisoner, and the Kingani, continuing the theme of animal sounds, was rechristened the HMS Fifi, French for Tweet Tweet. Fifi was the first German warship of the war to be transferred into British service, and for this accomplishment, Spicer Simpson was promoted to the rank of commander. Despite the Kingani's sudden disappearance, bad weather on the lake prevented the Germans from investigating until January 1916. In the meantime, Spicer Simpson bolstered his flotilla with the Belgian steamer Del Commune, which was renamed Vengeur or Avenger. In mid-January, the Hedwig von Weissmann, under the command of Lieutenant Job Oderbrecht, scouted around Kalimi, but finding nothing, turned around and returned to port. On February the 8th, she set out again, with orders to rendezvous with the Graf von Gotzen the next day. Early that morning, Spicer Simpson spotted the Hedwig and launched a flotilla consisting of Mimi Fifi, the barge Deton, and a motorized whaleboat to intercept her. While the Hedwig was faster than Fifi and Deton, Mimi was able to steam circles around the German gunboat, while the longer range of her three-pounder gun prevented the Hedwig from returning fire. Oderbrecht circled the ship to dodge Mimi's fire, allowing Spicer Simpson aboard Fifi to close in for the kill. However, at the last moment, Fifi's 12-pounder jammed, and Oderbrecht took the opportunity to flee and rendezvous with the more heavily armed Graf von Gotzen. Spicer Simpson and his crew struggled for 20 minutes to clear the gun while the German gunboat steadily slipped away. But then, with its last two shells, Fifi scored a direct hit on the Hedwig's hull, bursting her boiler and killing seven of her crew. With the ship now a burning wreck, Oderbrecht ordered scuttling charges set and his men to abandon ship. The second German gunboat on Lake Tanganyika was now out of action. Only the formidable Graf van Gotzen remained. While his fleet of small boats had more than proved their mettle, Spicer Simpson decided he needed a bigger ship if he was to tangle with the Godson. He found it in the form of the St. George, a steamboat belonging to the British consul in the Congolese capital of Leopoldville. Spicer Simpson had the St. George dismantled, dragged to Lake Tanganyika, reassembled, and armed with the Belgian 12-pound shore defense guns. By this time, however, the strategic situation in East Africa had changed. British and Belgian troops had begun advancing north towards the port of Bismarckburg, and Spicer Spicer Simpson's flotilla was ordered north to support the advance. However, upon arriving at Bismarckburg, Spicer Simpson found the port defended by a heavily armed fortress and chose to withdraw his flotilla. Little did he know that the fortress guns were actually wooden dummies, the originals having been commandeered by General von Litto Vorberg for use as mobile artillery. Spicer Simpson also missed his chance to engage the Graf van Gotzen, which was withdrawn from Bismarckburg and on July 26, 1916, scuttled at the bottom of Katabi Bay. She would later be salvaged in 1918 and still plies Lake Tanganyika to this day as the ferry MV Liemba. By July 1916, British and Belgian forces had retaken control of Lake Tanganyika, though the East African campaign would drag on for a further two years. In fact, General von Leto Vorberg would not surrender his forces until November 14, 1918, three days after the armistice had taken effect. He was one of the few German commanders to remain undefeated in the field, and on his return to Germany, he was hailed as a national hero. Geoffrey Spicer Simpson, however, would not be so lucky. Despite the ingenuity and determination he had shown in his bid to end German 
domination of Lake Tanganyika. His frequent quarrels with his Belgian allies led to his being reprimanded by the Admiralty, and he was never again given a naval command. He did, however, become Assistant Director of Naval Intelligence and served as a naval delegate and French translator at the 1919 Paris Peace Conference. He was later elected as the first Secretary General of the International Hydrographic Organization in Monaco, in which role he served from 1921 to 1937. Jeffrey Spicer Simpson died on January 29, 1947, at the age of 71. Though he was never to attain the legendary status of General von Leto Vorberg, Spicer Simpson's unorthodox naval campaign on Lake Tanganyika was no less a military accomplishment than those of his great rival, a feat described by his Belgian allies as a feat unique in British history. Rarely have officers and men of the Royal Navy worked in an environment so foreign or met conditions of greater difficulty with more ultimate success. And if all of this seems just a bit familiar, the Battle of Lake Tanganyika served as the inspiration for the 1935 C.S. Forrester novel and the classic 1951 film The African Queen, starring Humphrey Bogart and Catherine Hepburn. So I really hope you found this video interesting. If you did, please do hit that thumbs up button below. Don't forget to subscribe. And as always, thank you for watching.